when John Kemp, Kemp spoke that, uh, on that uh, workshop, he talked about, what's it called? So there's three ways how you can get two weights into the soil. And one of them is deduction, deduction or something like the root. The roots of the plants bring Build, down... Building humus in the soil. Building humus or adding humates? Adding humates. I mean, the article that he wrote was about adding humates. Well, he was so saying, car carbon induction is the word he uses, which is basically that making the sugar and dropping it into the soil, right. which is not adding humates. That's not humates. That's building humus, potentially. Yes. But adding humates are a product, like a Band-Aid is a product. A humates are something that's mined out of the ground, it's a specific type of material that has high levels of humus in it. Right. Um, they say, I mean, humus versus organic matter is probably an interesting just point to make. Mm -hmm. um, organic matter is anything that used to be dead. Um, anybody ever built or know about people who built these um, column raised beds with little boards all around them? They take the soil and they bring it in and they put it in, <clears throat> which is usually a lot of compost and maybe some sand or something. Um, and then next year, that raised bed is no longer full. It's two inches less full. And then the following year, it's again two inches less full. Have people seen this happen? Um, that was compost that was organic matter, but was not humus, and instead turned into carbon dioxide. So compost is about 98% organic, you know, non-humus organic matter. It's like half a percent or one percent humus. Humus is a stable form of carbon that you know has a half life of dozens of years or hundreds of years. It's this, you know, it's a basically it's a byproduct of fungal digestion, as I understand it, um, which is very very stable. Um, humates are a product which is mined, which is found in between peat moss and coal in the geological profile, um, which has about seventy to ninety percent humus, as opposed to compost, which has a half a percent to one and a half percent humus. So, um, <clears throat> it's something you can use to mix with your um, trace elements, um, it, you know, because it has a really high bonding capacity. Um, it'll increase, you know, uh, exchange capacity. If you've got a, a sandy, light sandy soil, it's the kind of thing that can help increase exchange capacity. Um, um, yeah. But so that induction process... Carbon induction. Carbon induction, which is through photosynthesis, the plant brings down lots of... Uh, makes sugar out of through photosynthesis and injects it into the soil, into the soil. which feeds the soil life, which exactly. feeds the bacteria, which then are fed, which are then our food for the fungi, which then, as a byproduct of their digestion, will you will have humus. Right. But it's multiple steps in that process, yeah. and any number of things can short circuit it. I so. misunderstood him to say that actually stable humus was built there directly, but this is really a much humus slower... Humus and humates are yes. two different things. You I can't, know, I know. Stable humus can be built that way, yes. That is correct. Yeah, but it has to go through the bacteria and then into the fungi. And it's a, it's a multiple kingdom okay. process, as I understand it. Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> so I can erase humates. I'll this. All right. Any other questions, comments, conversations that came up during lunch? Yes. How much of a um, are the sugars that are coming from the plants? Is that like the main diet of the microorganisms, or is it just like uh, that? Is basically um, yeah. Um, they will eat organic matter, dead right. plant material, but <clears throat> that is the foundational diet. So. You mean they may be feeding the bacteria, which are then feeding the fungi, which are then feeding the nematodes, which are then feeding the. Right. Um, but it's basically, it is the primary source. It's right. where it starts. And it's not just sugar. They're called plant root exudates. So it'll be sugars with various amino acids attached to them to make them um, more appropriate for this set of species or that set of species. Right. Yeah. We're simplifying it by saying it's sugar. It's more than just sugar, but it is primarily sugar. Yeah. And you can tell basically how much um, you know, that sugar plus everything else is being made in the plant in real time with the refractometer. This is something we'll talk about tomorrow. Um, you can test the bricks feeding of the plant and that'll tell you, you know, functionally how well this process is occurring. Um, and this is when it's um, good for you to be prepared to be humble 
if you're not already, um, because we have our target levels and we have reality, and oftentimes they're <laughs> very far apart. Um, but you can identify the problem. You can say, look, this plan is not going to enforce synthesis sufficiently well. You know, you can see it in May instead of waiting for July to see the disease show up. You can give you a big, big window. And if it's cloudy and rainy out, have you guys had a lot of clouds and rain this year, or just a lot of rain? I heard a lot of rain out here. No. May, June, wasn't heavy rain. A lot of rain. May, I heard some lots of vulgarities coming out of Vermont earlier this year. A lot of friends of mine were like, were like, this is a horrible year. We're getting deluged. This is so. You've all forgotten already. <laughs> but August was great. <laughs> I think it was like moderate here, except for a dry spell. Different parts of the different different areas had different issues. Yeah. Yeah. I heard a lot of people complaining in, in, in May and June. I had pretty steady good rain. Okay, fine. Yeah. Anyway, in those periods, in those periods when it is cloudy and rainy, um, um, this is I think was one of the people know about Lake Blight now because it's been around for a few years. But the first year we got Lake Blight, it's, um, it was one of those years when it was really cloudy and rainy in the spring. It was um, really cold and cloudy. Um, <clears throat> if there's not much sunlight, then it's difficult for the plants to make much sugar, right? And if it's difficult for them to make much sugar, then they probably don't have a lot extra to share with the soil life. And if it's raining a lot, whatever is in the soil is probably being leached out. So um, for me, if I was to envision an animal, you know, undergoing a similar situation where all their nutrients are being leached out of their system, um, I would call that diarrhea. Um, and I think that's basically something similar to what the plants experience when it's cloudy and rainy. Cold and cloudy and rainy is they're basically getting whatever nutrients are available are, you know, are being leached through the system. And, and they've got, I mean, so basically it's got like a bad case of, of GRD or something like that. Um, which kills hundreds of thousands of people a year, but which can be cured for 10 cents. Right? People know about this? Somebody, I'm not sure if somebody won a Nobel Prize for it. Char no? What's that? Charcoal for? A little, a little electrolyte pack. Oh. A little packet of sugar and salt added oh. to water wow. is all you need to maintain your electrolytes so your body can you know, get over, get over the bad case of diarrhea, which is basically all it's doing is just draining all the energy out of your system. So a lot of people, you know, kids in Africa die from diarrhea, <clears throat> which can be cured basically with electrolytes, which can be cured for your plants basically with electrolytes. If there's not enough sugar being manufactured in the leaf or it's being leached out of the soil, then all you have to do to address the deficiency of sugar is Add sugar. Add sugar. <laughs> Wait a minute, it's not that easy. It's that easy. Add a little bit of salt, a little bit of salt, a little bit of salt water. Get a, you know, you get a pound of Himalayan sea salt, stick it in a five gallon bucket with of water, solubilize it, and put it through the irrigation line. Right? With a gallon of, with a gallon of molasses per acre. And you can prevent this underlying deficiency symptom from, from um, going into place. Um, basically, then you've got, then you have basically the plant starving to death. Um, <coughs> yeah. When the, uh, uh, when that is happening, when it's raining and cloudy, yeah. are the uh, bacteria, fungi, I think, sucking on the roots, and that's what makes it go down. Uh, makes the nutrients go out of the plant. Is there a, an action that happens at the low uh, soil level that uh, grows? When it's when it's cloudy, there's not as much sunlight, so it's, so the plant can't make much sugar. So it doesn't have much extra to share in the first place. Agreed. Whatever's in the soil is being leached out by all the rain. A lot of a lot of what is in the soil, anything that's soluble at all, is oftentimes being being drained out through the, through the subsoil. But, but is it being sucked down, like for instance, the osmosis that makes sap go up? Does it, do, the, do the bacteria suck That's a it good down? question. I don't think so. Okay. I don't know. Yep, great. I think they just, I think they just don't make enough. Yeah. Which means that the populations can't expand, and yeah. the roots can't build. And, Got it. Um, you go through that period of from being six years old to being 10 years old yeah. and being starved. Yeah. And that's going to have a significant impact on your adult body if you're going to hit puberty at age 12. Um, and get knocked up, um, which is functionally what happens to your tomatoes, um, you know, in July when they're two feet tall, is they have their first flowers and their flowers 
you get pollinated, and then they set fruit, and they are nowhere near to having an adult body, and they're pregnant. So imagine being pregnant at 12 or 13 <clears throat> after being malnourished, um, and you're going to be um, in rough shape because your body will prioritize the baby over you and suck the minerals out of your bones. Mm -hmm. And if your bones are weak and small anyways, having a baby is going to basically suck your life force out, mm -hmm. and you're going to be weak and susceptible to infestation when it shows up. Mm -hmm. So if you understand how it works with animals, if you understand how it works with humans, for me the metaphor is not just a metaphor, it's actually very close, very similar. The basic biological life cycles, you know, germination is birth, transplanting into the garden is kindergarten, you know, first flower is puberty. Um, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can see these things, if you understand the life cycle, you can see where the plant's at in its life cycle and you can um, yeah, be more, more proactive. So what would you right. do for it to help the tomato plants or help the young mother? Um, I like to feed her. Well, I liked her to be <laughs> given a, a, as good food as possible. So I grew up on the tomato farm and we would always clip away the first truss. Mm -hmm. So the plant would be much bigger before it would start carrying, before you allow it to start carrying. Sure. Oh, well, yeah. Well, if, if, it's, if it's setting fruit when it's too small, I pick them right off. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But in general, I try to keep my plants well fed, so. Um, but I do oftentimes not, you know, pick off those first, first fruit, couple of fruit. Absolutely. So by well fed, are you talking about the electrolyte mixture or other? That was just a crisis management okay. conversation. I'm not sure how I got even on the, on that okay. tangent. Um, tomorrow's agenda is primarily about in season okay. monitoring and management. So um, we're going to be talking about that in depth. Um, <clears throat> all right. Well, I'm going to go through a few of these things on the board because I don't want to have them all to deal with before o'clock. Um, so. Okay, uh, bacterial and fungal ratios um, is, a, is a good good topic just for a, a broad structural perspective. This comes from the work of Elaine Ingham, whom some people here I'm sure have heard of. Um, bacterial fungal continuum. This is one to one. This is the uh, biomass in the soil. How much bacteria, how much fungi. Here it's the evenly balanced, one to one. Here it is. Um, one to a million. So a fungally dominant environment, and here it is a million to one. So a bacterially dominant environment. Um, if my understanding is that if you take uh, bare rock, like if you have a volcanic eruption um, and the magma cools, and you come back a month later and you do a microbiological assay of that environment, you will find it is a um, bacterially dominant environment. Bacteria are the first um, kingdom to, to uh, colonize. Um, say you're in Hawaii. Uh, you come back 500 years later and it's a climax forest um, and you do another microbiological analysis and you'll find it is way over here. <clears throat> An almost entirely fungally dominant ecosystem. So um, my understanding is that soil naturally evolves from bacterial dominance to fungal dominance if you just let it be. Um, and what's interesting about this whole concept is there are different species of plants that flourish under different microbiological milieus. So some plants flourish in a primarily bacterial environment. Some plants flourish in a primarily fungal environment. And all plants have their space in this trajectory. So um, what we call weeds, uh, things that grow generally where we want our annuals to grow and outcompete them, um, things like pigweed and lamb's quarter and gallon soda and ragweed and stuff like that, um, prefer a bacterially dominant environment. This is where they flourish, when bacteria are dominant in the soil. Um, what we call crops, basically what you can buy in a seed catalog, prefer a about a balanced bacterial fungal um, dynamic. What we call um, you know, blueberries and raspberries, so, so the, the uh, brambles and things prefer a somewhat more fungally dominant, and then what we call uh, perennials, trees, um, you know, fruit trees, nut trees, things like that, prefer an even more fungally dominant environment. So um, <clears throat> this is part of the insight for me about uh, weed control and management is that if you are doing things that's causing a bacterial dominance, 
then you're going to have weeds outcompete your crops. If you're doing things that move your soil more towards fungal dominance, then you're going to have your crops getting into a position where they can outcompete the weeds, which is something that's been happening more and more in my farm in the last couple of years. It's something I wouldn't have believed if anybody had told me this, even just like three or four years ago. I'm like, that's a nice idea, but I don't believe you. I've never seen it. I can't believe it. It can't be true. Um, until now I'm getting used to it, which is <laughs> a nice place to be. It doesn't happen all the time, but it's happening more and more. Um, and I think the primary um, thing that I do that affects this is tillage. Um, we understand that tillage um, is uh, very destructive to the soil ecosystem. Um, I like to use a metaphor of a door tiller going down, um, you know, a Broadway or something in New York City. Um, any, any big drag in any big city, think about that, you know, a main avenue, um, say it's 40 feet wide, say you had a rototiller that was 40 feet wide, and would therefore, to, to scale, be, you know, six feet deep or something. Like, if you had that scale of a rototiller coming through that kind of road, um, there's all these little microorganisms living in their little boxes, right, on the 20th and 30th and 40th and 50th floors, and they aren't necessarily getting killed by the rototiller going through on Broadway. Um, however, the effect on their environment is going to be such that they will be unable to live there subsequently. Um, if you till up Broadway, you're going to till up the water mains, the gas mains, the cable electric lines, the sewer lines. Um, subway. Subway may or may not be tilled up, but probably the entrance to the subway. Um, um, you know, they're not going to be able to be fed, to be watered, um, to stay warm, and so there's going to be a mass population um, crash in that environment. How it would happen is an open question, but conceptually, when you till the soil, when you shred that ecosystem, all those little airways and waterways and foodways and everything else, through tillage, you, you functionally cause mass die-off. Um, I like to say, if you haven't um, caused genocide recently, um, and you want to before lunch, um, be responsible for the death of a few hundred billion organisms, take the tiller out for 15 minutes, and go for a spin. And by the time you get back, you can, you know, have your lunch peacefully knowing that you've been responsible for the death of billions of organisms. It's not complicated. Um, you can, it's, it, it's a technical fact. Um, <clears throat> so, what happens is there's a mass die-off, and then the organisms which are simpler, the bacteria, are the ones that re-establish first. The fungi are these big, long, hyphae, hyphal networks, these web-like things, um, and it takes a while for them to re-establish. So what happens after tillage is a bacterial flush, it's called, mm -hmm. and that functionally is the environment where your weeds will flourish, because the weeds have a job in nature, and that is to cover exposed soil. Nature is you know, got a little bit of modesty, and she doesn't run around naked, right? <laughs> she has to keep herself covered. Where in nature do you see bare soil? Right. You don't see bare soil in nature. She doesn't do it, only when she's not doing well, right? So any practices that you engage in that involve soil being bare are, you know, anathema, are counter to the way nature seems to run things. So um, that, you know, I hope I'm, I'm being sufficiently um, explicit and um, visceral, so that these concepts are being driven in. Um, and then moving forward, the desert. There is in the no desert. Way. Nature's struggling. There's right? nothing. She's in Crohn's state. She's right. she's dying. She's almost dead. We're looking. What we want is a savanna. You know, we want trees and and forbs and grasses and nuts and berries and four leggeds and two leggeds and you know we want to have the land of milk and honey. We want to have, that's that's the land of milk and honey where you have most production that you know where. I think which is the way Native Americans were managing North, the Americas um, was a savanna ecosystem to a very large degree. Uh, they weren't doing agriculture with tillage and annuals. They were doing perennial polyculture masterfully. Um, and it, 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 it seems that model was the, 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 the savanna ecosystem um, was the one they were working towards. So I think that's, for me, that's the sort of a vision of, of what the landscape could be. Um, not hay fields and forests, but you know, let's modulate that. Let's have trees in the fields and more glades and glens in the in the forests. Um, <clears throat> anyway, um, we can till the soil, and you have a mass die off, and then you've got a bacterial flush, 
is when the weeds germinate. And so if you don't do that in the first place, then you don't create an environment where you've got the bacterial flush, then you don't have the environment where the weeds germinate. Um, that's my understanding of, of this. Um, there's another piece of that which is compost, and <clears throat> um, a lot of people do use compost, so I just want to talk about some of the ingredients, and um, depending on what you build your compost pile out of, it can either be bacterially dominant or fungally dominant, and if you want to apply the kind of compost that causes your weeds to grow vigorously, um, then you would make a bacterially dominant compost, and if you want to apply the kind of compost that will cause your crops to grow vigorously, then you want to put a fungally down the compost. Just jumping back for a minute, I yes. was always taught that tilling um, created new weeds simply because it turned up weed seeds that were now able to grow <coughs> because yeah. they were closer to the soil. Mm -hmm. Surface? I mean, do you just think that's part of it as well as giving it the best environment? Um, but I was always told no tillage is great simply because once you exhaust the, the seeds, weed seeds. Then um, you're not I, I've seed. heard that certainly for sure. Um, this aspect is something that I think is pretty solid in the microbiology literature and a very interesting um, conceptual framework. So um, maybe there's some combination of the two. Yeah, I mean, it's the same yeah. result. It's the same result. Tillage causes weeds to grow. <laughs> <laughs> Whether you want to deal with it or not, it seems like there's a nice correlation there. I have found that shallow tillage does not have that effect. And if I go through with a really light till, if I've got my beds basically in place, I'll just... So if you, if you were to look at ground level, on my farm, it looks like this. About a four foot bed with about a one foot pathway. Maybe, you know, depending on how long a fence I made the pathway, it may be, you know, two inches deep or eight inches deep, but it's just a little divot, basically. Um, and I, that's established. And I, this is the space between my tractor tires. And that's, I've got a bed former that goes behind the tractor, and I've got a four foot tiller that I use sometimes, and I've got a little, a tri built walk behind tiller that I use sometimes. But I try to till about that much to prepare a seed bed when I need to. If I don't need to till, then I don't do it. But um, if and when I need to, I try to do a shallow till. And that seems to be, I seem to be able to do broadcast of, you know, things like salad green seeds and carrots and beets and stuff like that and have them come up and never have to weed them. Um, only after the second or third picking or something like that. If there's any residue, I may go through the mower first, and then a shallow, and then I may put my like my one size fits all general purpose fertilizer, mineral fertilizer down, and then I'll do a shallow till, and then I'll plant, and then I'll rake, and then I'll water, and that could all happen in a two hour period, mm -hmm. just one after the other after the other. Just so I'm going to go out and plant greens today. Okay, let's go. Um, um, but all the, the basic infrastructure is in place. Yeah. Um, so the thing about compost is um, <clears throat> apparently fungi can break down wood and bacteria can't. They're pretty close to something along those lines. So anything that's woody, uh, wood chips, sawdust, shavings, um, is, has, it's called lignified carbon. And only fungi can break it down. And if you have a significant portion of your compost pile's carbon ratio piece, right? There's a carbon energy ratio when you're building a compost pile. If a significant part of the carbon piece is woody materials, whether it's wood chips or shavings or um, sawdust, when that compost pile is done composting, it'll be fungally dominant. Because only the fungi can break down wood. If you don't put wood in your compost pile, if you have your carbon sources coming from something other than wood, then you'll have a very um, bacterially dominant compost, um, which is likely to have the effect of causing your weeds to grow vigorously. So that would be an example of what manure, alfalfa, or timothy, you know? Any straw, hay, leaves, you know, that you think are gonna be your carbon side of your carbon nitrogen ratio are gonna, uh, they're not lignified carbon. And so basically, because the bacteria move in and establish themselves rapidly, they're going to outcompete the fungi and I become see. dominant in the compost pile. And they can eat all that stuff. So they will functionally do the, mass, the vast majority of the composting will be through bacterial action. And what about manure? 
Uh, manure is, you know, obviously it's not woody. But I mean, that would get the nitrogen side, generally. And that breaks down mostly. And that'll, feed, that'll also feed the, the bacteria. That's what I thought. If you don't have wood of some sort of wood, and leaves are not wood, um, if you don't have some sort of wood in your compost pile, you should expect your, your compost when it's done. Composting to be bacterially dominant, which is likely to have the effect of causing weeds to grow more vigorously than crops. It's a bacterial inoculant. Um, anyway, that's my understanding. It comes from a woman named Elaine Ingham. If no one's heard of Elaine Ingham, um, she's well worth looking up. Um, she's been on the cutting edge of microbiology um, in agriculture for 30 years. One of the first PhDs to say that all germs aren't bad. To say, actually, maybe some of these bacteria and the fungi in the soil are friends with the plant, <laughs> not enemies. Yet we don't have to use fungicides all the time. Um, and she's been, you know, on the cutting edge and getting a lot of flack for decades, but has done a lot of good research. Um, that's the bacterial fungal thing I wanted to say. Um, rotations, I know that people are probably um, pretty confident that rotations is the right thing to do. Um, I'd like to just sort of walk through the logic of rotations for a second. Um, I certainly was brought up on a farm when we were kept close track of which beds were what and always had a you know, three-year plan mapped out and where it was going what and who and things like that. I also had experience growing up um, that we could plant the potatoes on one side of the road one year and you know on the other side of the road the next year and about two days after the potatoes came up all the potato beetles would all be on those potatoes. Um, anybody ever had that experience? Mm -hmm. And flea beetles will always find the brassicas and the cucumbers and summer squash and zucchini and winter squash always get taken out by powdery mildew. Um, rotate all you want. Anybody else have this experience? I'm getting a couple of yeah. a couple of nods. <laughs> no one wants to really raise their hand. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, there's one data point, which is that we've been properly rotating for a long time, and still the pests and diseases seem to be successfully um, uh, taking out the plants. So maybe um, a different tact is appropriate. Um, <clears throat> my understanding of rotations is that the logic behind it is you don't want to wear out the soil from one crop. You don't want one crop to pull too much out of the soil. Um, and if there's are, are any pathogens in the soil, you want to break the cycle. So you don't want the plants to get that disease next year. So um, the first point I would say is if you do a good job building your soil, you shouldn't be worried about any crop wearing it out. Um, generally the, the concern is about heavy feeders, quote unquote, like, you know, brassicas. Broccoli is a heavy feeder, you have to follow it with a light feeder. Um, well, I don't have nitrogen on my farm, period, full stop. I don't believe in adding nitrogen. Um, I think that two-thirds of the atmosphere is nitrogen, and any self-respecting farmer should be able to harvest plenty of nitrogen out of the air. Um, so that's, I mean, we can talk about that one in more detail if you want. Um, but my experience has been that if you create an environment where the plants are healthy, um, and the concept here is that if they are creating a gut flora that is appropriate for them, like if you've got broccoli creating a, a gut flora in the soil uh, for brassicas, then it wouldn't actually make a lot of sense to put onions in there next year because you're basically inoculating um, rabbits with the gut flora of a duck, right? Like, it would be better to inoculate rabbits with the gut flora of a rabbit. It would be better to put broccoli in the soil that already had all these species that are symbiotes for broccoli in the soil. So um, if that makes sense to anybody, um, I'd like to put it forth as a, as a thought experiment. Um, maybe even something you can actually experiment with. Um, so, And you have had success doing that. I successfully do not map anything or bother to remember where anything went. Um, and I'm sure I violate the uh, rotation regulations on a, reg <laughs> on a regular basis. Um, yes, I will grow. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and my disease pressure and pest pressure is not non-existent, but it's absolutely dramatically less than it has been um, in, in my experience as a farmer. So, um, if you're certified organic, I'm not sure if anybody here is, is certified, um, you do have to follow rotation regulations, I'm pretty sure. But for those who are not, I would um, just lay that out there as something to cogitate on and see what you think. Um, so, 
as we face Beyond future. not even worrying about where you put stuff before, are you actually promoting replanting in the same spot for years on end? Uh, do I to be that put my tomatoes back in the same spot year after year? Yes. Um, I think it might actually be a good idea. I, you know, so the, the, the